From here, we can start to lay out how these revelations from V extend their implications and effects throughout the other games. The first subject I want to cover here might be considered taboo by some fans, but I believe Metal Gear is only explained by the presence of time travel technology existing within this alternate timeline. For example, how did Strangelove make that AI in the 1970s if there isn't any kind of time travel? What about the constant anachronisms in Metal Gear, like the calorie mate invented in 1983 found in 1964's Salino Yarsk? The word Sahelanthropus wasn't coined until 2002, so Huey's line describing the robot in 1984 or even the 90s couldn't be possible without knowledge of the future or some future context written into that version of events. And a future context being written in itself suggests time travel. Metal Gear Survive shows us how time travel works in Metal Gear. I mentioned earlier that traveling back in time creates a new derivative timeline from the Traveler's arrival point, and this makes sense given what we're told about how the Lord of Dust works. The Lord of Dust exists in the far future of Metal Gear, and from that endpoint a wormhole to the past is opened, which splits off that past from its own would-be future, as this wormhole would create a new derivative future from that point, and then the new future would be summarily consumed by the nanomachines. The captain's crew in Survive stops one of those wormholes mid-formation with their Archaea trap in Sahelanthropus' railgun. This trick is then repeated from that new past-future point, going back to before the first wormhole opened, creating another derivative timeline in which the Lord is no longer arriving from the first wormhole, as this new timeline bypasses the older timeline with the previous wormhole. This mode of operation is consistent with the crew of Survive's detail being cut off from their own past by changing things when they sent Chris back at the story's end and killed the Lord of Dust. Chris's arrival back in 1943 would have branched that version of their past off into a new future disconnected from their own, which explains the post credit scene where this new Chris, now as good luck, is berated due to no wormholes appearing in the sky over MSF's base. The change comes from the captain killing the Lord of Dust in this timeline's new future, which stops these spontaneous wormholes. And presumably that new good luck would then find another captain in their version of the timeline and send them to the future repeating the loop with the info from the successful previous loop to aid him. Theoretically, since the wormholes wouldn't be there to take the captain's arm and infect them with the dust, which is what enables them to make their journey at all, this new timeline would presumably have some other circumstance that results in the Lord of Dust being defeated. This is where the reasoning behind making Fox the main character of MGSV arises. Metal Gear operates by crafting its own stories out of already existing pop culture references. We're all aware of the plethora of references in Metal Gear, and it's even become something of an internet meme to joke that Kojima always just steals his ideas from other works of art. And indeed he does. But in the same way Metal Gear in 1987 was inspired by iconic movies like The Terminator, by 2015, Metal Gear itself was a pop culture icon. So Metal Gear has appropriately become self-referential, the consequence of which puts it in a cycle of self-creation. Metal Gear constantly references itself throughout the Phantom Pain, and indeed you could consider plenty of moments from earlier Metal Gears post-hoc references to the future games today. Metal Gear Solid V operates via a process of creating its own story by referencing itself and its own past, enabling the adding of new context from the future. Fox arrives in the past, creates a new timeline, and then sets to the work of ensuring the new Chico gets put on the path to becoming Venom and eventually Grey Fox. And with successive playthroughs of this game over time, we ourselves have recontextualized our own history with it over and over again, recreating our own past via the new context of our present experiences. It's a natural process to continually recall a past experience with a fresh new perspective you gained over time, and Metal Gear's story in V is about that. Appropriately for Kojima's reputation, there's a helpful movie reference that can aid you in understanding this kind of loop that's been authored here in The Phantom Pain. If you've ever seen 2001's Donnie Darko, uh, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about already. Sahelanthropus' entrance in Hellbound is the jet engine scene, pointing to Fox's death at the feet of Sahelanthropus being our way out. Skullface is Frank the Bunny to Venom Snake's Donnie. One of Null's cover identities is Frank Hunter. Think of all the mirror scenes. Donnie Darko is a movie about a seemingly normal boy who ends up playing a pivotal role in avoiding a disaster by choosing to travel back in time to sacrifice himself, from one way of seeing that plot anyways. This is exactly what Fox does. 
He travels back in time, then sacrifices himself to the foot of Sahelanthropus in order to save himself as Chico and also his timeline. Think of all the veritable baggage Fox buried as Skullface for Venom and the others in Cypher in that whole episode, and how things could have gone much worse. He's quite literally killing the legacy left behind by the mutiny. Sahelanthropus itself doesn't make sense unless you consider that V's events occur amidst the middle of an already established time loop, and Ishmael has already experienced the previous loop like Frank and Donnie Darko. The beginning is actually the ending, missing a certain context which the protagonist has to go about the task of creating, and this is why the hospital scenario plays out twice as it does in The Phantom Pain, with only a slightly altered context in the end added to what we already know. The DD nickname ties this all together even more. As Frank says in the film, do you believe in time travel? I'm sure there are plenty more details worth tying between the movie and the game that I'm not mentioning here too, so go watch it again and see what you can connect. Let's think about Skullface's actions in Hellbound for a second. Here he's recreating the hot coldman scene from Peace Walker, but his addition of the word back to Huey when he says I'm taking back your legs is from our reckoning also a reference to Ocelot's line from Metal Gear Solid 2 to Scott Dolph. Steel? No, I'm taking it back. Skullface has added this word back to Coleman's original line that's a reference to both past and future events because to him, like the players, those events are in his past. He's already been Chico and then lived through the events of the rest of Metal Gear before he comes back to play Skullface here in his big finale. Paz also says the line in Peace Walker in a scenario that almost exactly matches Ocelot's future scenario in Metal Gear Solid 2. This to me is just more evidence of future knowledge existing in the past of Metal Gear via the Perfect Soldier data. And this is all thematically appropriate because we have been our own enemies in a way this whole time since the Phantom Pain's release, as it's our own lack of understanding this interpretation which has stood in our way from seeing this game for what it really is. Skullface stands in for our future selves, and with this in mind, his words and actions in the Phantom Pain take on a whole new meaning. With this knowledge that Skullface is a role, not a singular person, we can then go through the work of tracing the legacy of this role and indeed others throughout Metal Gear. Almost every game has a figure standing in the villainous place Skullface occupies in his narrative, along with a few other roles that are repeated over and over with slight alterations. Earlier I compared Hot Coldman to Skullface, and I think going beyond that we can also compare Hot Coldman to Volgan. These characters play the role of antagonist in Snake Eater and Peace Walker, and in Phantom Pain, Skullface is our new Colonel Volgan, the leader of a breakaway unit intent on destroying the status quo via their plans. Given that Naked Snake was the protagonist of Peace Walker, it makes sense that Hot Coldman stands in for Zero in the original Big Boss's larger struggle for control of Cypher. Hot Coleman is the identity Zero crafts when he becomes the antagonist for this operation, and this is why Venom has to deal with the man on fire during his campaign as Big Boss. He is his own antagonist, and so an echo of his own misunderstood identity rears its head in the form of the zombie Volgan. The literal antagonist from Snake's past, from the role's past, makes his return here to play a kind of reactive role to Venom's own psyche occupying the role of Snake with the memory and identity issue that he has. In the same way the player at first has trouble distinguishing between Venom Snake and Naked Snake, so does Venom himself. The Man on Fire and Skullface are acting as external manifestations of Venom's own traumatic past as authored by the future version of himself, as are Tretage, Quiet, Eli, Kaz, and the others on Diamond Dog's base during the Phantom Pain's events. There's no real final boss fight against Skullface in the Phantom Pain because it wouldn't be appropriate to fight yourself directly in the game in this fashion. Consider that the only place where you can symbolically fight yourself is in the PvP FOB mode where you attack identical bases to your own and fight other versions of yourself. This mode could be considered an analog for a final boss in a way if you consider that this mode is meant to be replayed in the endgame over and over and you're constantly facing other players like yourself. Presumably one could fill time playing this mode chasing the idea of nuclear disarmament, thinking that maybe triggering that event would somehow produce a resolution to the Phantom Pain's events. But of course, as the game's narrative itself tells us, disarmament isn't an option. Deterrence is the only solution. Code Talker's Wolbachia is exactly this kind of deterrence, and you can consider these videos as another kind of deterrence against chasing phantoms, looking for answers that probably don't exist because those questions aren't the right ones. 
Most of the direct conflict from Venom comes against the Man on Fire in situations where Skullface is present, as if the Man on Fire is the external manifestation of past trauma to Skullface's internal manifestation. So Skullface's final conflict plays out internally at Sorak in a cave in the form of symbol and metaphor. Volgan represents the external aspect of Snake and later fizzles out when he sees Venom Snake's eye color isn't the stark blue of the original Naked Snake and this shuts down the reactive loop, causing Volgan to remember his own death in the past and return to a dormant state. We also are presented with the opportunity to reflect on the implications of the eye color. Compare this remembering death to how Virgil teaches the Lord of Dust about the concept of death to kill it and survive, and how I describe Joy's victory. The Outer Heaven incident, then, must have been Venom acting as Big Boss while Ishmael played the role of Grey Fox. Fox is playing two roles in this scenario, as technically he also played two roles during Ground Zeroes as Chico and his Snake, and then again as Snake and Skullface during the Phantom Pain. One of Fox's tricks is that he's often playing two roles when he's active in a scenario, like the dual identities of Johnny Sasaki and the Cyborg Ninja at Shadow Moses. I'll go over them in more detail, but he's also playing the role of Peter Stillman at the Big Shell, and also Richard Ames. He's also Akiba during Metal Gear Solid 4, and someone else in that scenario who I'll describe later. Chico Libre and Amanda Libre paint an almost picture-perfect parallel to the story of Frank Hunter and Naomi Hunter, and given what all I've revealed here about Chico being Fox, it makes sense that Amanda is Naomi. Compare Peter Stillman to Fox. Stillman is the first one to train Raiden in the big show. He carries a cane kind of like Fox's blade, and he's exposing Snake's real identity to Raiden in a swap of Fox's role from Shadow Moses when Snake exposed Fox's identity to Campbell. And Stillman even is blown up by a bomb in a classic Fox trick faking his own death that goes back to Metal Gear 1. Remember, bombs don't kill him, they just fuel a transformation. Stillman is probably the younger Fox. If Fox had a strong hand in authoring the drama played out at the Big Shell, it would make sense that his second role in the scenario would be Ames, someone Raiden meets after Stillman's death. This is probably the elder Ishmael Fox. Compare this to how Decoy Octopus was in disguise as Anderson at Shadow Moses, and how Anderson was one of the system designers. Consider that Ames' suspected affair with Naomi may just have been a cover for passing information to his sister. Compare Fox's role as an informant at Shadow Moses under his deep throat identity to what Ames has Nastasha Romanenko do, and how Ames gives Nastasha the Fox die data. If Ames was one of the Patriots, then it makes sense he's probably Grey Fox. His heart attack was yet another stage death for the sake of the script. So if Fox is around during the Big Shell and faked his death again, it's almost certain that he's around during Metal Gear Solid 4's events as well. He's reprising his old cover identity as Johnny Sasaki, which also explains why he looks so much like Snake. That's also probably how he was immune to SOP. Since it was a derivative of Fox Die, and he was the origin of Fox Die, he probably had some kind of immunity to its effects. Well, maybe the stomach issues. Anyways. The Elder Fox is playing another role in this whole scenario, but I'm just going to have to put that off for a second. Let's move on to post-Metal Gear Solid 4. It could be that Sam Rodriguez from Revengeance is Fox in disguise yet again. He's probably the Elder Fox. Fox often takes a dive in his fights and loses on purpose if it serves the mission, really starting with Skullface taking a dive to himself, so it follows that maybe he allows Raiden to defeat himself to have an excuse to pass on his sword to use against Armstrong while also burning his cover identity. Compare Sam's lost arm to Fox's lost arm in his fight against Liquid, another fight Fox probably lost on purpose. Fox's parasites could explain how Sam has no cybernetic enhancements yet is able to outperform everyone. Compare Mistral to Quiet and consider that random out of context love story between her and Dolzaev. Perhaps that's the younger Fox's identity in Rising Revengeance's scenario. After all, he does end up getting blown up. One Fox always tends to get blown up, while the other one always tends to get fatal heart trauma, just like with Stillman and Ames. But now we have to explain Zanzibar Land. Who is this big boss at Zanzibar Land if it wasn't Ishmael or Ahab? If Old Fox had abdicated the big boss title to Young Fox in or before 95, then who would the title have passed to after Venom's big boss met his demise at Outer Heaven? It wouldn't really fit the equation for Old Fox to become big boss again here. I think this is where Solidus comes in. 
We're told there's a big boss whose moniker was Saladin, and we're never directly shown this Saladin in the Phantom Pain. We can presume the big boss at Zanzibar Land then was probably this Saladin, and since the names Saladin and Solidus have such striking similarities, I like to think they're probably the same person. Solidus was a clone of the full-grown naked snake, and so he probably began his life at a later age, probably at the age Big Boss was in 1971, which to my reckoning would make him 39 at birth. In many ways, Venom is symbolically a stand-in for Solidus. Solidus's Eli was Raiden, and Venom's story in Africa dealing with child soldiers is a stand-in for Solidus dealing with child soldiers in Liberia. So Solidus was probably gathering child soldiers at Zanzibar Land himself, and his appearance as Sean Connery could be a hint to his advanced age as a result of the cloning method used to make him. And yet again, there's a film reference to add more context. The movie Highlander stars Sean Connery as one of the immortal Highlanders, warriors granted with powers that draw them to find and fight one another in duels to the death until only one remains. Connery plays a man named Ramirez, who trains the younger Highlander, Connor McLeod, played by Christopher Lambert. The notable thing here is that the Highlanders exclusively use swords to fight, and victory can only be achieved by beheading one's opponent, as a Highlander can heal any other wounds. Ramirez uses a Japanese katana just like Solidus. Solidus and Fox may have trained together at some point and honed their sword play, as we see Fox wielding a blade in 05 at Shadow Moses, and we see Null as an expert with a blade during Portable Ops in 1970. Solidus probably also had taught Raiden how to use a sword while he was a child soldier in Africa. Christopher Lambert also plays another Thunder God, Raiden, in the movie Mortal Kombat. So superimpose those two roles of Lambert's in the one movie, and you get Solidus' history with both Gray Fox and Raiden. Just imagine Connor McCloud in Mortal Kombat. All this business with Big Boss's fight against Zero being mostly hidden from what we see might make sense when we start to question what Big Boss did with all of his autonomy from Zero. I think Naked Snake got some of Cypher's members to mutiny with him, mainly Paramedic and Sokolov. It's likely that Big Boss inserted the two parasite samples into Chico as a test, and then I think he went off and did it to four or five more kids, making the ones we know as Psycho Mantis, Vulcan Raven, Decoy Octopus, and Vamp, all by repeating what had been done to him as a child with specific DNA strains for each one. I'll go further into what I think happened with this redacted mutiny later on. There are many characters throughout Metal Gear games who are actually the same character from another game, just in a different disguise under a new cover identity. I think these parasite people will only transform if they're killed in a human fashion and only something like fox dye that attacks their parasites on a genetic level can actually permanently kill them. Like Highlanders, there are fake deaths and then there are true deaths, which are a little different. These parasites can only be killed by another parasite, which is what fox dye is for. Compare Fortune's appearance with the Joys. Fortune is who Sniper Wolf transformed into after Shadow Moses. Fat Man's boss fight shares its geography with both Vulcan Raven's second fight at Shadow Moses and the Fury's fight in Snake Eater, while Raven's first fight in Metal Gear Solid evokes the pains in Metal Gear Solid 3, and the Fury in the pain is the recipe for Code Talker's abilities. Vamp from The Big Shell has more than a few similarities with Psycho Mantis' fight at Shadow Moses, and if Mantis has Vulcan's DNA in his makeup, he's probably not able to be killed with guns like we appear to do during Metal Gear Solid. In fact, the vamp we see in Metal Gear Solid 4 lacks many of the abilities used by Vamp at the Big Shell, such as his red aura. So probably Mantis was just posing as the real vamp in Metal Gear Solid 2, using his telekinesis and teleportation to mimic Vamp's abilities, and the real vamp doesn't come into the scenario until Metal Gear Solid 4. Maybe those three took a dive and were passed over by Fox Die at Shadow Moses, and then reformed with stolen cover identities as Dead Cell to face Snake again at the Big Shell. Compare the cut characters from Metal Gear Solid 2's scenario to those removed by Fox Die in the previous game. From this view, the Metal Gear Solid series acts as a kind of series of filters where certain characters are removed from the equation over time via methods like Fox Die for reasons that aren't immediately apparent, while others are killed but not metaphorically beheaded as a Highlander must be, and those live on to fight the next battle. Those who survive take something with them from their experience, and through that process they're able to develop and grow. Rat Patrol 01 in Metal Gear Solid 4 is just a cover for these surviving ex-Foxhound members. 
mean, how appropriate would it be that these four are what's left of Foxhound and Deadcell, and they're the main ones taking on Liquid Ocelot, their old leader, who took them rogue before betraying them? Compare Ocelot's rebellion to what I've laid out about the original Big Boss turning against the rest of his comrades in 1975. Meryl in 4 is the same woman as Paws, Quiet, Sniper Wolf, and Fortune. Jonathan in 4 is another version of Vulcan Raven, Fat Man, and Code Talker, but with his mostly bald head as a giveaway. And Ed in Metal Gear Solid 4 is the same person as Trettage, Psycho Mantis, and Metal Gear Solid 2's Vamp, just under a new cover. Metal Gear Solid 4's Johnny Sasaki, Akiba, is the younger Grey Fox in disguise. His and Meryl being wed at the end of 4 takes on a whole new meaning if that was Paz and Chico finally tying the knot. You can even see Sunny kind of like a new version of Paz talking to a boy who could be like another version of Chico right after the wedding ends. As if Kojima was telegraphing at the end of 4 the upcoming story between Paz and Chico for Peace Walker. There's kind of a cyclical and looping context implied by that detail. So the boss in her in boss position is backed up by her five Cobras in Snake Eater. Hot Coldman also has his five AI operated bosses in Peace Walker. Skullface has us fight his skull units five times during the Phantom Pain. Liquid Snake has his five Foxhound members at Shadow Moses. Solidus Snake has multiple sub bosses for Raiden to fight at the Big Shell. And Liquid Ocelot puts Old Snake through a number of sub boss fights with the BNB Core before that scenario's big finale. These scenarios are authored to be recreations of the previous scenario with some evolution made in the process. Every scenario has a secondary group involved that's opposed to the goals of the status quo on some level, like Volgan's separatist group with Tatiana, Ocelot, and Rykov, or philanthropy led by Solid Snake at the Big Shell with Olga and Otacon. Someone in that group always betrays someone else during the scenario, like Liquid as Miller, Ocelot, Paz, and even Solid Snake does it to Raiden. There's always two system designers of some kind in the game, like Sokolov and Granite, or Emmerich and Strangelove, or Baker and Anderson, or Ames and Johnson, or Fox and Zero, and so on. Every single scenario in a main Metal Gear Solid game follows this same kind of formula. Taking this analysis to Portable Ops' scenario suggests several things right off the bat as to that game's deception. Gene is probably Zero himself. The game's scenario depicts a conflict between Snake and Gene, the goal of which in Gene's head is to determine who's the most worthy soldier to carry on the legacy of the boss. So this is probably Zero standing in as the leader of Cypher after Snake refused the title of Big Boss in 64. Ursula and Elisa are probably a result of the union of the Joy and the Sorrow's DNA inside Eva, her split personalities representing this light-dark duality, a creation from the remains of the bodies of those recovered after Snake Eater. Python and Snake's relationship calls back to Grey Fox and Solid Snake's relationship, suggesting Python is like a proto-snake, someone also with parasite powers gained at death. If a fever killed him, then the coolness of death and the relief it brought would explain his powers of controlling the cold, and also draws comparisons to Vamp. Cunningham, in my mind, seems obviously like Sigand, what with the way he uses technology and how he might be considered pretty good with software, but not so good with hardware. And if Gene is Zero, then Hot Coltman is also Zero in disguise, and then Zadornov is probably Ocelot. Compare Zadornov's lost right hand to the hand Ocelot later loses at Shadow Moses. A lot of the missing context of Peace Walker's scenario can be explained from the perspective of this reading of these two games as a cover for depicting the conflict between Zero and Big Boss. Admittedly, I've yet to play Portable Ops, and I've only read about the game a lot and watched all of its cinematics. So I'll hold off on trying to speculate too much more about the game's story before I can properly experience it myself. All of this implies something very provocative about Ocelot, however. We assume Ocelot is a product of the union of joy and sorrow, but if that's the case, why doesn't he have the psychic powers like Ursula, Trettage, and the Sorrow himself? Ocelot's superpower is speed, if anything. The other character with that power is Zero. Ocelot is probably a secret child of the Joy and Zero. And this would also explain Eva. She's probably another secret Zero child. If Zero was the one playing the role of Campbell at Shadow Moses, and Eva is the one playing Meryl, then the familial relationship those two share could be a cover for this. And, you know, Gene's ability in Portable Ops is called Zero Shift, and it allows him to teleport. And Ursula also has this skill in that game, 
and it's also functionally identical to the teleporting ability that Fragile and Higgs have in Death Stranding. Uh, just something to keep in mind for part four. If you want to learn more about Zero Shift, Kojima first used it in the Zone of the Enders game as far as I know. It's used there in regards to some of the technologies used in the orbital frames, the big mechs. They can store their sub-weapons in this zero space, which is sort of like a bag of holding from D&D, just called zero point space. In that game, a zero shift is also an instant transmission teleport. Consider how in the Bible, God made Adam and then made Eve from the rib of Adam. If Metal Gear's analogs for God and Adam are zero and ocelot, then the mythology suggests that Eva is a clone of Ocelot. And uh, they do look a lot alike, don't they? Remember how there was all this business about how Eva was a Chinese spy, but there's this dissonant lack of Chinese presence anywhere in Metal Gear Solid? Well, another word for China is Siam. You know about Siamese twins, right? What if through some kind of parasite-fueled birth, Adamska and Eva were literally born out of Joy's body mid-battle. Both twins split at the ribs into a sister and brother pair, like Athena from the forehead of Zeus? I'm sure it'd leave a hell of a scar. And not to distract too much, but also compare that to what we know about Malingan and Lachna in Death Stranding. I'll go into it more in part four. Now this brings me to the next topic I want to go over for this part, the Philosopher's Legacy. We're told by several characters in Metal Gear that the legacy is essentially a bunch of money and a bunch of bank accounts put there a long time ago. Now, I'm not an expert in economics, but it seems like that's a little dubious, given things like inflation and how slowly money just sitting in a bank tends to accumulate. It seems more likely to me that the philosopher's legacy is not a pile of money, but is actually something that lays out the genetic tree of the parasites. The control of the legacy is what enables Cypher's organization to do everything it does after 1970, including Big Boss's experiments. If the legacy was secured in whole as a result of the portable ops scenario, then that would explain how Cypher was able to create the clone children in 1972. It could also explain how Strangelove was able to craft an AI that so accurately recreated the Joy's personality in 74. Compare the technology found in Snake Eater's 1964 to the tech of 1974 like the flying vehicles from the jungles of those scenarios also featured in Portable Ops. Many of these probably came from the future to begin with or were inspired by future technologies adapted to or recreated in the past. I already speculated a decent amount about the origin of these parasites, but there's still more that I want to go into. I mentioned earlier that Code Talker probably has a parasite produced from the Pains and the Furies. If Code Talker is Vulcan Raven, well then that would explain a lot. The Pain's boss fight requires Snake to land a grenade on a small target while staying on the move in the water, just like the tank fight against Raven in Metal Gear Solid 1, where you're trying to land a grenade in the tank hatch while not getting run over or shot. I already mentioned how the Furies fight also compares to the second Vulcan Raven boss fight where he has the minigun, and compared those to Fat Man's fight at the Big Show. I think those fights can also be compared to the Metallic Archaea mission in the Phantom Pain when you're rescuing Code Talker. So let's take this logic to the rest of Foxhound. Sniper Wolf, as I stated earlier, is almost certainly an expression primarily of the Ends and the Joys parasites. Compare her boss fight at Shadow Moses to the Ends fight in Metal Gear Solid 3, and also her death scene to the Joys final moments. Decoy Octopus is probably a combination of the fear and the sorrow. The fear's power would allow him to externally mimic a person via the fear's body morphing parasite, while the Sorrows allows him to mimic their inner selves via its spirit channeling power. The scenario of the encounter with Octopus and Metal Gear Solid is limited, but compare Snake's descent from the ducks with the fears jumping around in the treetops before coming down to face you during the fight, and how the Sorrows encounter is mostly talking. And of course Liquid Snake is just a copy of Naked Snake. Naked Snake was probably a creation from the union of the Joys and the Fears parasites. If you look at the Fear's face, it has a striking similarity to that of real-life actor Kurt Russell, and indeed so does every Snake's face. The face of Snake is the face of the Fear. It's a crafted identity from existing references by artificial parasites that were making a monster descend against the human invaders from the past, probably a combo of at least the Predator and Snake Plissken, since those two movies' formulas fit the post-apocalyptic jungle scenario. Psycho Mantis, the psychokinesis wielding telepath, has obvious similarities to the Sorrow. It makes sense Mantis also has Volgan's parasite in his DNA since Volgan's power deals with kinetic energy. 
This might be why Mantis resonates so much with the Man on Fire in the Phantom Pain. And if Venom also has Volgan's children in his DNA with his own memories of Snake, then the three's whole feedback loop makes perfect sense. This all would also explain how Volgan animates when Venom approaches him without Mantis present in the side up where he's finally extracted. Volgan's body's parasites probably can't be destroyed, and so like the Lord of Dust, Volgan's body simply has to be taught that it's dead. When Volgan looks into Venom's eye and sees that it isn't the stark blue he hates, he remembers his own death before staggering back and fading into oblivion once more. Gray Fox also has more in his DNA than just Volgan. Volgan's parasite would explain his electrical powers, and it's also likely Fox has the Joy's DNA for his fast healing. Naked Snake probably had access to the material to create the Archaea in 1975, which was probably made from combining Volgan's and the Pain's DNA. The mist dispersal ability of the Archaea likens it to a kind of pheromone, and Volgan's energy transforming ability likely grants the Archaea its corrosive qualities. That was probably what was put into Chico's head, and then into his heart was placed another parasite, which was also a union of two different strains. Chico inherited Big Boss's own parasite, the diamond combination of joy and fear. So Gray Fox probably has at least joys, fears, pains, and Volgan's DNA in his makeup. And if I'm right about what happened in the Morpho explosion, he also would have received a second dose of Joy's DNA, along with whatever else was in Paz's DNA via her body parts being embedded in him. So Chico's four combined parasites also mated with Paz's eight combined strains. Joy, Fear, Pain, Sorrow, Fury, and Vulgan, and Zero. With her entire body being destroyed in the explosion, it makes sense as to why as quiet, her entire body can decohere and then reconstitute itself out of the dust in the air. This is like a combination of the Archaea powers, Joy's burst healing, and the end, the fury and the pain's parasites transforming her skin and body into the thing that is being dispersed by her powers. She's sort of able to recreate that explosion and then reverse its effects at will while she's quiet. Consider how the pain can create entire hornets from his parasite. Quiet is the hornet in a sense. And if Paz is the same person as Elisa, this is where the Sorrows and Zero's DNA came from and what allows Quiet to stay coherent after her body is destroyed. Her spirit is still there via the Sorrow's powers, evident by the lard thud her invisible self makes after jumping out of the chopper in the Phantom Pain's post-mission cutscene in Cloaked in Silence. The Zero gene is almost certainly linked to reflex mode in the game mechanics, and both Quiet and Venom have this ability. Venom's ability to change his face relates to his face being lost in this incident. And since Chico's entire body didn't get destroyed, it makes sense that he doesn't have access to this level of the ability that Quiet does. Now, not to get ahead of myself, but I have to mention this now. Compare Quiet's ability to decohere and reform to Fragile's ability to teleport in Death Stranding and how Fragile has a higher Dooms level than Sam. And just keep it in mind for a bit, okay? I'll get back to it in part four. The specific recipe for Fox's parasite DNA can be identified in the structure of the prologue mission, which is also mission 46. The number 46 is relevant because it's the number of chromosomes in the typical human DNA, hinting towards this mission containing the makeup of Venom's own DNA. Each encounter that Venom has with the enemy faction, which is here entirely scripted by Ocelot and Old Fox, relates directly to one part of Venom's parasite DNA. First up is Quiet's attack, which stands in for the joy. Her actions here are an echo of Naked Snake's redacted actions, and in fact many of the scenes in this hospital scenario are just recreations of this redacted mutiny. After being blown back, both Ahab and Ishmael flail and writhe on the floor while Volgan approaches, which to me indicates they're being pinned to the floor in sheer terror. In other words, this scene stands for the fear part of Fox's DNA. The third encounter comes after Ishmael fixes Ahab's shoulder, and the two crawl through a treatment room while an XOF soldier brutally assassinates a pair of patients while we are forced to watch silently. The way in which these two are killed is particularly violent, and one would assume pretty painful. Each is shot several times before being finished with the final bullet, so this is emblematic of the pain, with the bullets standing in as the original's hornets. A fourth encounter then happens after navigating the stairwell and exiting into the crowd of patients in a hallway. This is a mass death scene, and relates back to what I described earlier with the sorrow. 
So this scene seems to indicate that Venom does indeed have sorrow as part of his DNA, which I think makes sense. Once Ishmael and Ahab leave this room, they have to blend in with the dead bodies on the floor from the mass shooting, while four soldiers comb the remains for any survivors. And isn't it weird how they don't spot these two at first, but then because of the busted IV bag and Ahab's movement that the soldiers are alerted? And then Mantis appears with Vulgan. I think this scene is standing in for the Vulgan parasite strain in Venom's DNA. This scene is about reactivity. When I first watched this scene, I thought the liquid on the ground was urine, in reference to Otacon wetting himself during the Metal Gear Solid scenario. But of course, that's an intentional fake-out, and Venom's actions in this scene make sense from that perspective. To the new player, this bag is a total fake-out, and the reaction to that which we have and Venom also has is what gets Venom spotted. In turn, the metaphorical reactor, Vulgan, appears and takes care of the guards for us. After navigating more stairs and watching Ishmael kill a guard and give us a gun, we get control back to shoot a fire extinguisher and then two more guards before another short cutscene depicting another encounter happens. This part with Ishmael giving Ahab the gun seems to me as a symbol of how both of them have inherited the legacy of a gun, that is Naked Snake's legacy, but with Ishmael taking it from the dead body and then handing it to Ahab, this action symbolically stands for the passing down of his own legacy to himself. Then after we shoot the fire extinguisher and kill the two guards, another cutscene plays. At the end of this one, Ishmael leaves Ahab alone to deal with the rest of the lobby guards. This could stand in for the zero gene action. The way Ishmael jumps off the side of the stairs into a seemingly open spot and then just disappears suggests that he's using some kind of teleportation to get outside. The way reflex mode kicks in right as he jumps suggests that Fox is using his zero DNA in this move. I think Raiden also has this zero gene in Rising Revengeance and is what enables him to use blade mode and Zandatsu enemies, so it makes sense that Fox has this gene as well, it's just called reflex mode in Metal Gear Solid V. After the player gets control back and makes their way through the lobby, yet another encounter happens in a cutscene. This one shows Vulgan descending the stairs and using his fire to kill a pair of soldiers before exploding in a rage to kill the remaining squad. Symbolically, Vulgan just did a little fury recreation which indicates that Venom also has the Fury in his DNA. As Fox, I imagine the Fury part of his DNA relates to how he can sometimes go berserk, and for Raiden 2 it could have links to his Ripper mode. After this cutscene, there's a pair of sections where the player gets control for a few seconds before more scripted events happen, and eventually Venom is rescued by Ishmael running over Vulgan and giving his younger copy a ride away from the burning hospital. This whole section here is a recreation of the lead up to the helicopter crash in Ground Zeroes, where Snake rescues Miller from the fiery base, makes it away, but then is intercepted almost immediately and brought down in a wreck. This whole part probably stands in for the end being part of Fox's DNA, as this is a recreation of Chico's ending. In other words, Fox and Quiet both have the full DNA of the Cobras plus Vulgan and Zero in their DNA. Lastly for this section, I'd like to add another kind of time-bending physics into this whole mix of how Metal Gear is experienced, as if things aren't complex enough already. I do believe time travel is happening in the universe, but I also think part of that scheme is that inside the Metal Gear universe, Cypher makes the Metal Gear games themselves as simulations for its soldiers to play. Everything so far suggests that Zero, Fox, and probably others are aware that they're in a video game. Consider the Deadpool colored alternate costume that Grey Fox can get at Shadow Moses and how Deadpool is aware of the comic book format he resides in. So for these games to exist within their own universe kind of seems natural actually. I think each game in the Metal Gear universe released at a particular date for a particular purpose and maybe even for a particular soldier. For Venom's case, I think the Ground Zero simulation was released in 1985 while Venom was still in the hospital at Dekelia as part of his old preparation for the upcoming operation. So this would explain why Ground Zeroes has this kind of future past feel to it. It's a vision of 1975 experienced via 1985 within the universe. And in this same way, I think the Phantom Pain is a vision of 1986 to 1995 experienced around 2006 to 2015 after Shadow Moses and again after Four's events. The two games feel slightly different in some subtle ways as if Ground Zeroes is an earlier build of the same game system, and we already see Venom with an MSX playing 1987's Metal Gear. 
The primary function of the Phantom Pain in-universe is likely for Grey Fox to reinforce his memories and personality while he's playing all these different roles, so he has kind of an anchor point to return to after being a role for some time. The Phantom Pain may have been made in-universe starting after 2002, when the term Sahelanthropus was coined in reality, probably in the lead-up to the Shadow Moses operation. It's likely the anachronisms in the various games are related to the years they released in-universe, potentially explaining the calorie mate in Metal Gear Solid 3, see if that game was made after 1983 within the universe. Solid Snake probably played through a version of Metal Gear Solid 3 in his youth, and since he was 12 in 1984, maybe Metal Gear Solid 3 was released in universe in 1984. Maybe even in that hospital in Dekelia. Maybe Cypher released Metal Gear Solid 3 and Ground Zeroes in 84 and in 85 in that hospital as a part of Solid's and Venom's tutelage. Compare this way of viewing the game's existence inside the game universe to the way we all experience Metal Gear. To put the game in the game is a very metatextual technique, and it definitely fits the Metal Gear series and Kojima himself. It's almost explicitly stated that Raiden has played Metal Gear Solid 1 and the VR missions attached to that game in his dialogue to Snake during Metal Gear Solid 2, and this kind of self-awareness makes perfect sense given the narratives here that I've pointed out. So in this way, each Metal Gear game really has at least three temporal reference points built in. One, the year when the scenario took place, a second year when the game was released in the game world, and a third when the game is released in real life in our world. Of course, I think the way this practically happened in the universe is that at some point Cypher gained a whole database of knowledge about the future, probably in that Perfect Soldier data, and in that database were the Metal Gear games from the previous version of the timeline. But then Cypher can't just release these games as is either, so they probably use this data as a foundation for them to build their own timelines version of these games, separated from the time in our reality when Kojima's team made the games. In fact, I think in Metal Gear's version of reality, Kojima Productions is a real team that exists, and they make the Metal Gear games for Cypher within that version of the timeline. Of course, this suggests that Konami itself is Cypher, or at least an arm of it within the Metal Gear universe, and I think that makes a lot of sense.